Looking at your art school admissions portfolio, I think what you're doing really well is first of all, you're putting in a huge amount of effort to really experiment and work with a wide range of different subjects, all different kinds of media. You have black and white pieces, you have color pieces, and every piece really takes a very different approach. To me, that really says that you're very open to experimentation, that you really want to try a wide range of new different ways of working. And that's really what a lot of art schools are looking for. They don't expect you to be professional and hyper accomplished because that's the reason that you want to go to art school. But they do really want to see, I think, the potential and the willingness to try out all of these different ways of working. I really see you pushing yourself in terms of your concepts, in terms of your subject matter. And that's so important in an art school portfolio because I think what happens is a lot of students, they get really fixated on the technique. And so they feel that they really have to show off what they can do in terms of their technique. And they don't really think about why they're making the artwork or what their motivation is or what the subject matter is about. And you have a number of pieces that I think really do tackle narrative, that talk about presentation, that deal with different kinds of subjects. Some of them are really charged in a way. And I really admire the fact that you're so gutsy about doing that because I think it is easy to just sort of sit down and just sort of mindlessly draw what you see. And what I see in your portfolio is you're not doing that. I really feel that in a lot of your pieces, you really are give offering an interpretation. You're showing us a very particular point of view. And I really think that's what artists are here to do. We're not here to just be drawing machines. We're here to really say something. And I see that in a lot of your pieces that you're really communicating something very specific. One aspect of the art school admissions portfolio that I think is really important to consider is not just the individual pieces in the portfolio, but how the portfolio looks overall. For example, what I see in your portfolio is you have a number of pieces that are very accomplished for one reason or another, but you also have a couple pieces that I think either look unfinished or seem like they weren't worked on as much. So what you wanna to try to do in your portfolio is to get every single piece in your portfolio to the same level of standard. Because I think when things vary in terms of how finished something is, how accomplished something is, it's almost like the weaker pieces really kind of bring down the stronger pieces. And so that's where I think for a lot of students, making more than the number of pieces that's required is a really smart way to go about it. So for example, if you have an admissions portfolio and they're asking for 15 artworks, make 30 artworks. Because chances are, if you make 30 artworks, you're gonna get a much higher um, level of quality because you have more to choose from. I would consider working on your color a lot more because color is one of those aspects that I think a lot of people are very intimidated by because there's just so many things to think about when you work with color. And the way that I see you working with color in a number of your pieces is you have a tendency to isolate the color. So for example, the purple is purple, the yellow is yellow, the blue is blue. And I don't see a lot of crossover in terms of the colors. I want the colors to kind of weave into each other much more. And I just feel that a lot of the pieces, the use of the color is very literal. If you look at a patch of grass, we might assume that it's green, but actually there's little shades of yellow, there's tints of beige. Sometimes there's even like a deep red in there or something. So you have to kind of teach yourself, I think in a way, to seek out those less obvious colors whenever you're observing something. So that would be something to work on as well. I would also try to make sure that your skills in composition, which is how you lay out your subject on the page, is a lot more consistent because you have a couple of pieces, like for example, some of the still life paintings that are beautifully composed. You have wonderful diagonals. I love the way that you're cropping a lot of the objects on the page. One object kind of seamlessly flows into the next. Those pieces I think are really accomplished and very well composed. On the other hand, you also have pieces like, for example, the clock image, which I don't think is as well composed because it seems like you didn't really think about it in advance. It seems like you, you took the clock and just stuck it in the middle and then didn't really think about how that related to the other aspects of the piece. So composition is another aspect that I think you got to get more consistent because the thing is, when we look at that still life drawing, we know how you can do composition well, that you are capable of that. And so by comparison, 
person, that clock piece feels lazy. So you, again, you have to make sure that that level of standards is met throughout all of your pieces in your portfolio. There's a wonderful sense of energy in terms of the way you're using the material. I really feel like there's a lot of movement in the piece. It seems very rigorous. I can kind of imagine that if I were watching you draw this piece, that you were working with lots of really strong, really kind of bold movements. And that's wonderful that you have such an assertiveness, such a confidence about using the material. I think that's great. I think for a lot of students, there's this temptation to make everything look photorealistic, smudge everything to death and you're not doing that at all, which I think makes your drawing look a lot more expressive. I also think it's a well-composed piece. I think that you have a pretty wide range of different kinds of objects. And even for example, the flower, which you have two of, you've positioned the two flowers quite differently so that one's kind of flopped over, one's kind of facing us. And so even that kind of love of a variety, I think is really beautifully done. The left-hand side of the drawing has been just neglected, like it just got left behind. I feel like it's calling a lot of attention to itself, pretty much because it looks incomplete. It's also evident to me looking at this drawing that you're using way too much vine charcoal. Um, vine charcoal is an excellent sketching tool. It's really great in the beginning parts of the drawing process when you're really sketching things out a lot. You want a lot of flexibility. What's great about vine charcoal is that it's super easy to erase. In fact, a lot of the times when I draw with vine charcoal, I don't even bother with an eraser because you can literally just take your hand and rub it out really quickly. So it's a very flexible, friendly material to draw with. I think what I don't see in your charcoal drawing enough though is use of compressed charcoal. Compressed charcoal is a really wonderful tool because it has a deep, dark richness that vine charcoal just is literally not capable of doing. And I see that in a couple pockets of your still life, like for example, the sunflower, um, a little bit below the mannequin on the left-hand side, I do see some black in there. But I really feel like overall looking at the piece, it is a very gray drawing. And so I'm craving just more blacks that can enrich the piece, give it a little bit more gravity. The other thing I don't see you doing in terms of your charcoal technique, I don't see you really using your erasers very much. Erasers are wonderful drawing tools. I think oftentimes people mistake them as tools that are just there to get rid of mistakes. And I don't think that's the case at all. In fact, a lot of the times when I'm drawing with charcoal, I spend more time drawing with the eraser than I do with the charcoal itself. So if you could get yourself a kneaded eraser, an eraser stick, a white plastic eraser, each one of those erasers does something very different, gets you a very different result. And if you can really mix and blend all of those charcoal supplies together, I think you're gonna find you're gonna get a richer experience. This is certainly a piece that can be improved. I sort of feel like whenever I review pieces, there are some pieces that I will literally say, just scrap this piece, it's not worth working on. Other pieces I'll say, you know, you just gotta tweak a few things. This is one of those pieces that I think it's very close, just needs a couple adjustments to fix up. I'm really excited about this image of a clock because I think it's a piece that has a surrealistic look to it. I think primarily because of the water at the bottom, it seems like there's something else going on in there that takes us out of reality. You're playing a lot with transparency. Like I can see in your painting technique that first of all, there's a lot of different colors in there. Like you've got little hints of green, little bits of white, different modulations of blue. I like the way a lot of the imagery overlaps on top of each other. I think that's beautifully done. I think, however, you might want to consider making the Roman numerals a little bit less pronounced because I think the problem with text is that anytime you have text anywhere, text is a big distraction because people can't help themselves. They have to read the text. It doesn't matter how fabulous the image is, the text gets them right away. Number one, the text isn't particularly well done. I sort of feel like the um, way that the text has been painted, the Roman numerals, they look a little bit sloppy. They seem like they should be more delicately done. So I think part of it is your technique, your execution of them isn't helping. I'm really excited to see this mixed media piece because I think mixed media is one of those ways of working that I think a lot of people are very intimidated by because then you think, oh, well, what materials do I use? How do I combine them? How do I get them to really work together? It's a very challenging thing to do. I think some people think that, oh, it's not a big deal. You just get all these materials and you throw it together. It's not, it's not that easy at all. 
And I think what I really appreciate about this composition is first of all, it's really ambitious. I mean, there's so much going on. And I'm one of those people that I would much rather see too much going on than not enough. Because when you have too many things going on, it's a lot easier to say to somebody, well, just take these things out and play this down, as opposed to being in a situation where I have to say, well, I don't have enough, I need you to give me more. The disadvantage of having so much going on is that sometimes it's hard as a viewer to know what exactly it is you want us to look at. And I find myself being pulled in all these different directions. It's almost like all of the different parts of your composition are competing for my attention. Like for example, I'm looking at the floor area. The floor has this very beautiful um, painterly white strokes that are super rigorous and dynamic. But then you also have the shelf in the background, which has this incredible range of all these kind of unusual knickknacks and objects. So I've become very curious about that. But then there's all these objects on the desk, there's the plant on the wall, there's the calendar, which is kind of ripped. And then there's also the figure, which actually ironically is the least interesting object in the whole page because the figure is the most simple. The figure is the silhouette. It doesn't have a lot of detail. So I guess what you have to think about in a composition like this is you have to think about yourself as a movie director. You have to assign roles to different parts of the composition. You have to decide who is the main spectacle, who is meant to be a supporting supplement to the piece. Right now, I have no idea. I'm looking at the composition. I don't know if you really want me to look at the viewer. I don't know if it's more about the environment. The environment is much more interesting than the figure. I, I sort of feel like the space communicates more about the person. I mean, I would really think about just taking the figure out altogether and have this piece be just about the room. If you can just better balance all of the different elements in the piece, I think that would work better. Like for example, I'm craving more detail on the desk. I feel like some of the objects on the desk are not as detailed as they could be. I sort of feel like the objects on the shelf, maybe some of those could be a little bit blurrier. So just think about the different levels of articulation that you assign to each object. Say to yourself, do I want this object to be really crisp and detailed? Do I want this object to be blurrier? It doesn't matter what you choose, but in general, objects that are closer to us in the foreground do tend to be more detailed and the objects in the background will tend to be a little bit blurrier and a little bit out of focus. What I would reconsider about this collage is the background because I feel like the background with the cityscape and the tree and everything, it's really, really busy. There's a lot going on. There's a lot to look at. Um, even just the tree itself is so captivating. But when I really look at your composition, when I investigate it, it's actually the more quiet, subdued part of this composition that I'm much more interested in. For example, the figure, the, the shadowy silhouette of a figure that's seated at the bottom part of the composition and their feet are like inside this water that's at the bottom. That part I'm very intrigued by because first of all, it's much more subtle. It's not as in your face as the cityscape. And it looks the least like a collage. For example, the background between the buildings on this side and then the tree in the middle, that part to me really looks like two photos that just got stuck together. I don't see a huge amount of relationship. Whereas when I look at the figure, the figure is so subtle and ambiguous and the way that the figure has been placed so the legs are going into the water, um, that area is a lot more mysterious. That area, I don't see the photo collage aspect being so obvious. So I guess what I would really consider if you continue to do these digital collages is you really have to find a way to hide the fact that it's a digital collage because I think that's what I see a lot with digital collages. It just looks like this random mishmash of photographs that just got thrown together and what doesn't work oftentimes is the transitions are not very good. So that it's almost like you have two things that are just standing next to each other and that's it. They don't really have much more relationship than that. I would probably honestly cut the top half of this piece so that you really minimize the amount of the building and the tree and really redirect the focus towards the figure. The other thing you could do is you could take the buildings and the tree and lower the contrast so that maybe the buildings and the tree become a little bit more ghost-like, they become a little bit more gray, you could even blur them out a little bit. 
That's a technique called atmospheric perspective. Atmospheric perspective is a means to show space where objects in the foreground are very crisp and very high contrast. And the further back they get into space, things become lower in contrast and they diminish in terms of their crispness and articulation. And I think this is a digital collage where you really need to push the atmospheric perspective part of it. The still life painting is definitely one of your most accomplished pieces in your portfolio. The thing that I really noticed about it is that it's one of those pieces where you sort of feel like no stone was left unturned. And there's sort of no shred of doubt as I look at this painting that every single part of this painting was thought about. I really feel like you took under consideration different sophisticated ways to work with the color. I think the brushwork is really assertive, very confident. And also the painting just in general has this wonderful richness to it. I mean, I just really feel like you layered so many different brushstrokes on top of each other. And so there's an incredible depth to this painting that I think is really outstanding throughout the entire piece. And the composition is excellent. I think the way that you laid out the objects, the way that you cropped some of the objects, the way that they lead from one object to the next, it really gets me as a viewer to keep moving throughout the entire composition. It's like no matter where I travel in this painting, everything is exciting. The color, first of all, it's beautifully integrated and the color is not so literal. Like for example, one of my favorite parts of this particular painting is the jug in the upper left-hand corner. Because when I look at that jug, I don't feel like I really know exactly what color it is because there's just so many colors mixed in there. Like the left side of the jug has this little streak of blue. And then on the right hand side, you've got like a little purple, which segues into the yellow. Then it turns into this mixture of grayish purple and blue. And so I love that area of that jug that the color is so beautifully blended together that we don't feel that the color is only one color. It seems like there's so many other colors happening. Another section of the painting that I think is fantastic is this orangey drape that's flowing downwards to the right of the skull. And that area, I think you got really loose with your brushwork and there's just wonderful energy. You're really thinking about light and dark contrast. Light and dark contrast is always the first thing to go when people work with color because they get so into the different kinds of colors that they forget that you do need to have a very dark dark, you need to have bright highlights, and you've got all of that. Like for example, in the lower right hand corner, underneath the plate, there's a really dark black shadow, but then the skull on the left hand side has a very bright luminous quality to it that I think is very beautiful. So great job on this piece. I think if you can get all of the pieces in your portfolio to this level of standard in this piece, you're gonna have a really strong cohesive body of work. I think this drawing has a lot going on in terms of the subject matter. The subject matter is so specific. You have a number of bird skeletons, you have the telephone pole, you also have the landscape, the circular format in the middle. So there's a lot going on. The thing is though, I feel like the execution is lacking in terms of communicating that subject matter. So even though you have a very intriguing idea, I don't feel that the execution is kind of holding up its end. For one thing, I don't think that you did enough research in terms of getting good, solid visual references for the telephone pole and also for the bird skeletons because Bird skeletons are unique, wonderful structures. I mean, what I would do if you can't um, go to a natural history museum to actually see them in person, which really would be the best thing to do, is at the very least get some textbooks, look online, look up the different structures. I really feel like looking at this piece that you just made them up out of your head. The telephone pole that you've put together, it feels so oversimplified. Like for one thing, I don't know that I believe it as a telephone pole. And also it, it just looks really plain. Like if you think about a telephone pole, it has a very particular kind of color to it. There's a real um, texture to it. And I feel that your image right now, it's missing all of those things. The circular shape, I don't really know why it's there. I don't see a very compelling reason. It doesn't seem to be contributing to your subject matter very much. The landscape, again, feels just made up on the spot. Um, I think the clouds seem a little bit underworked. And then also the color scheme for the whole piece just looks very washed out. I don't really get the sense that 
there's a lot going on in there in terms of color. So this is a piece that I think I would stick with the idea, but I would try to execute it in a different way. Maybe use a different material, get some good strong visual references. So I would scrap the piece, but I would not scrap the idea. I would keep the idea and just try another iteration of it because you have something good here. It's just that you need the execution to hold up. This painting I'm really intrigued by. For one thing, it's so totally different than all the other pieces in your portfolio, even your other pieces that are more narrative based. This one seems totally out of mythology in a way. I sort of feel like the creature on the right hand side feels like it could be out of Norse or Greek mythology or something. It has this monumental scale to it, which I think is very much because of the path that's on the left-hand side. I think if you didn't have that landscape, if you didn't have that winding road on the left-hand side, we wouldn't have any idea how big this creature was. I mean, as it is, the creature looks like it's a thousand feet tall and weighs 500 tons. And so this is where I think it's a great example that context and landscape and the environment that the animal is in really defines what kind of presence that that animal has. One thing that I think you should reconsider is the sun that's rising in the background, because I sort of feel like that's the generic flat yellow sun that everybody paints in the background. And I really think you just don't need it because the thing that you have on the creature is on the left-hand side, there's this like yellow highlight that I would assume is coming from that sun and then hitting the side of that creature. And then that implies the presence of a sun without you having to literally draw the sun in the background. So I would get rid of that because I just don't think that's necessary. I love the texture and the surface of the creature, like that whole chest area, almost looks like he has ivy growing all over his body. I do, however, think that the creature needs to be darker only because I know that the light source is behind the creature. So if the light source is back here, you would have to assume that the front part of the creature is going to be very, very dark, which I think would make it more mysterious. And then as a viewer, we have to work a little harder to figure out the images. So I'm very interested in this image. I just think you have to work out some of these technical aspects. This one to me is not about a bunch of actual people as much as it is as a bunch of figures that symbolize different points in time throughout a person's life. So for example, on the left-hand side, you have a fetus, and then at the end of it, you have the gravestone. So we really do see this piece as a sequential piece, as a figure going through various stages of life. And so that's why I'm wondering whether you could reconsider the shape and format that you're working on, because I sort of feel like this default rectangle that I see a lot of students use just because it's there, doesn't really work for the sequence you're talking about because you are really meant to read it, I think, from left to right because we are going from young to old. And I think what would work much better would be a shape that was more like a panorama, something that was very, very long and very thin, or something that was a vertical that went from top to bottom. So you could really emphasize that sequence. I think what's awkward is when I look at the piece, I start at the left, I go to the right and then I have to go back to the left and then I go back to the right again. And so it's almost like you're chopping up the sequence in a way that makes it difficult to follow. So I would definitely rethink that format. Because these are meant to be symbols and not particular individuals, I think that's fine. I don't think I wanna see these figures in an environment. I think it's okay for them to stand on their own. And then I think you really got to use some good references because I feel like the figures that I'm looking at, they really look like you just made them up out of your head. You weren't really looking at the anatomy at all. I mean, I don't think the figures need to look photorealistic, but I think you got to get the proportions at least in the ballpark. They look very squished. Like it's almost like somebody took the figure and just did this. I mean, I can see from looking at a lot of them that almost every single figure has legs that are too short. Um, I think it's a little strange that they don't have facial features. And so I'm almost wondering if maybe the way to go about doing this is to have figures that are more like silhouettes, figures that are not so naturalistically drawn, because in some of these, you do try to do a little bit of modeling. You are specific about anatomical body parts. And I wonder if you could tell this story better if you did silhouettes 
I'd get rid of everything but the figures. I sort of feel like the skull at the bottom, um, the flowers, the wilting flowers. There's this big black thing in the lower right hand corner. I don't really know what that is. And then there's these like random black splotches everywhere that just look like mistakes. I don't really know what they are. I would just say, keep it simple. I think you, you got too many things going on here. I like this idea of a sequence of life and all these symbols, but it's like you're so scattered all over the place that we're really having trouble following your train of thought in this piece. This painting has some good things going on in terms of the way that you're drawing the structure of the face. But for me, there's too many other kind of larger distractions throughout the entire composition. My suggestion would be to just crop the whole upper side, crop the whole right hand side, just have it all be about the face. Because I think unless you're gonna get really involved in the environment and really put something back there that's gonna keep our interest going, there's no reason to dedicate such a huge acreage of your drawing to a space that really doesn't have anything going on. I mean, for me, when I look at the face, the face feels like it's only about 25% of the image, and yet it looks like the only part of the piece that you really spent your time on. And so that's where that consistency is important because like that still life we looked at earlier, you thought about every part of that piece. You looked at the corners, you looked at the edges, everything was given equal treatment. I feel like this is a really unbalanced piece because part of the piece it seems like you worked really hard on and then there's a whole other section of it, quite a bit of it that you just totally neglected. I also sort of am guessing that this is drawn from a photograph. I think if you want to do a portrait, your best bet is to do a self-portrait because number one, you get to work from life, which is much better. You're the best model because you're available 24 seven. And quite frankly, you're not going to turn yourself down in terms of posing. You can work with a mirror. You can set up a lighting situation so that you can really create dramatic shadows. Um, you can really control what the piece looks like and you can work on it as much as you want. I mean, if you, place the lamp in a place that it's not going to move and you tape where your position is and you get the mirror and you don't move the mirror, you could work on that drawing every day for seven days and it would be totally fine. Because the other thing I see about this piece too is the lighting is not very evident. I feel like the face, the shadows aren't very clear. I feel like the face is dark. The face in general has this mushy look to it that's a little bit scratchy in a way and I don't get a really palpable sense of bone structure. Like I think if you look at a portrait, you really want to search for cheekbones. You want to look for the jaw bone. Those are two very particular parts of the skull that really will help you frame a portrait better. Right now, when I look at the portrait, I really have trouble locating the jaw bone and the, um, the cheekbone. They, they feel ill-defined right now. Don't chicken out on the hair because what I see a lot with portraits is people spend so much time working on the face because they feel that the face is so important and then they just spend no time on the hair. But hair can be so expressive. I mean, if you think about throughout history, there have been so many just incredible depictions of hair. Like I think about Peter Paul Rubens, who did these beautiful chalk pastel drawings of his wife, of his son. I think about a lot of those ancient Greek um, sculptures where they had these elaborate hair dresses and, and just incredible forms. Just don't tell yourself that there's nothing to draw on the hair because there's a lot. And I just sort of feel like the hair was just kind of thrown in really quickly and you miss an opportunity to really do something with that. So this is one of those pieces I would say in your portfolio, I would remove this piece because I think that there are too many fundamental issues with it to fix. And I think you'd be much better off just starting a brand new self-portrait from life where you can really control the lighting and just be a lot more conscious about that facial structure in the skull. I'm really excited to see a 3D piece in your portfolio. 3D work is very difficult to do, I think because you have to have some experience with the material. Sometimes people don't always know exactly what to use. It's a lot more involved, it takes much more time, but I love that you have one in here. And also the fact that as I look at the piece, it becomes very apparent to me that this is really intended to be a interactive piece, a piece where the audience participates in the making of the artwork, and I like that a lot. However, that is very challenging to do. I think there are different ways that artists have gotten people to interact with the artwork, but it's dicey because I think the assumption whenever people go into an art museum is just don't touch. 
I mean, that's sort of the message that you get, especially you've got all these museum guards watching you and everything, is that you, you don't want to touch it and you don't want to interact with it because that's kind of the norm. And so when you step outside of the norm, you have to think about a way to make the audience comfortable with interacting with it without kind of spelling it out a little bit too much. I mean, when I look at these pieces, what I really like about it is, first of all, you have all these jars and I think what's interesting about the jars is that what's inside the jars is ambiguous. I mean, it's a little hard to tell because I'm looking at the photograph, I'm not seeing the actual artwork, but I think I, I sort of wonder, well, what are these jars? What do they contain? What are they supposed to be? Why these particular jars? I'm asking myself a lot of questions, which I think is a good thing. I think that means that I'm curious about the piece. I want to know more about it. And so you're definitely sustaining my attention in that way. However, I think a lot of the text that you've placed throughout the piece, like for example, on the box, it says, what does it mean? And then there's a sign next to it that says, please share your thoughts. And then at the side, there's another sign that says phase. And I feel like the directions are really, really obvious. And I wonder if there's a more subtle way to say the same thing and communicate the same direction without being so blatant about it. Um, like for example, if, if you had the box open and there was no writing on it, and instead of writing, please share your thoughts, you just wrote share and had a pen right next to it, that maybe that would be enough to tell people that you want them to write something in card and put it in there. And you could even cheat a little bit and have a card that was already in the box that had something written on it so that people could look at that and say, oh, I see, I understand. I'm supposed to write something down and put that in there. Um, because I think sometimes when you put too many directions on an artwork, it's almost like people feel like they're being told what to do. And that's not as interesting as stumbling upon an artwork and kind of looking at it almost like a crime scene and, and trying to put things together. And then when you figure it out, there's this moment of revelation that I think is really exciting. The other thing I would think about is your presentation, because I feel like the table that you have, it's not a very nice looking table. And I almost feel like something that would be better would be like a nice white pedestal for these jars to sit on. Maybe the jars are stacked on top of each other on a shelf. I don't know. I mean, there's a million different ways that you could present these jars, but those are considerations. I mean, I've seen so many times where people have a beautiful sculpture that they've spent hours and hours on, and then they put it on this hideous base that just destroys the whole piece. I mean, it just kills you. I mean, I remember once um, I saw somebody did this beautiful figurative sculpture and it was so elegant and so lovely. And they had this stand, I'm not joking, it looked like a garbage can, it looked horrible. And they had the figure and they put the figure on top of the garbage can. I just thought, oh my God, that stand just destroyed that artwork. And so you have to be very conscious about things like that with 3D work. That's why it is so much more challenging. I feel like 2D work is a little bit easier because it, the assumption is that it just goes on the wall and that's pretty straightforward. But with 3D work, you do have to think about that. I mean, the other option is, do you take these objects, do you put them on the floor? Do you put them so that they're sticking off the wall? Do you have them so they're hanging from the ceiling? I mean, there's a million different ways you can do it. I just think that you haven't really thought that through yet. So really consider the presentation and how you want to go about doing that. Overall, I think you have a very good start to this portfolio. I think you are certainly on the right track. You have a number of pieces that I think are very accomplished that I think you can really see as kind of your guiding light for your other works. I love the fact that you're pursuing subject matter, that you're really thinking about different approaches and ways to talk about imagery. I think clearly you're an artist who really thinks. I think what you really need to work on is consistency, that you gotta get all of the works in your portfolio to that same level of um, accomplishment that is so evident in several of these pieces. And if you can do that, I think you're gonna do very well. And what I would just emphasize again is produce as much as you can. I, I would not produce 10 pieces if they want 10, I'd produce 20 and then you have many more options. And let's face it, every time you make an artwork, you're gonna get better. I mean, you're not gonna get worse. And even though each piece doesn't get incrementally better, I mean, oftentimes you'll do a wonderful piece followed by a terrible piece and that's fine, progress is not linear. Um, I, I think that initial um, push 
to make more work is really going to help you. You're going to be able to curate yourself better because if you only have 20 pieces and they want 20 pieces, you don't have any choice. So it's great to have more that you can choose from. And I, I'm excited and I'm thrilled about the, the diverse range of media, all the different ways of working that you're doing. I, I think it's a really great initiative on your part.